It was the best vacation planned. For months, we had planned to visit Cusco, Machu Picchu, the top Peruvian attractions. It's a place where my family hadn't had a chance to visit before. For my father, it would have been a chance to revisit. My mother, my brother, we had a great time. That was 2005. Fast forward 10 years, things changed completely. My father was turning 93, and at that time, he was in a hospital bed, impacted by Alzheimer's disease, a disease so pernicious that actually destroys the brain of a person. Complete change. Why do I mention this? Look at the impact of this type of disease. A person could be not feeling any symptoms, but eventually, step by step, progressively, and as of now, unavoidably, the brain is being destroyed by this disease. Why do I mention this today? Because artificial intelligence can actually help not only the patients, but also the families. If you had a person in your family impacted by Alzheimer's disease, you should know how painful can it can be, how difficult it can get at the end of that time for a person with you. Why AI? AI can help you understand when symptoms that still are not noticeable for a physician can actually be identified through imaging, either a CAT scan, an image that AI could look at and recognize initial symptoms of what Alzheimer's disease is going to be. Only when you're going to start this diagnostic early, medication can work. My father was diagnosed very late in the game. No medication would have reversed or even slowed down the progression of this disease. However, there is hope. There is the hope now that AI can help identify the disease at such an early stage that current medication or eventually new medication to be developed will be able to help and will be able to slow down the progress of this disease. This is just one example of how artificial intelligence can give you hope, can give you a solution to a problem that is still hard, impossible to solve. We achieved a milestone. The milestone was for a machine to be able to de defeat the master champion in chess, Gary Kasparov, in a series of matches. That was, at some moment, impossible to imagine. People thought, this is not going to be a feat that's going to be achievable in our lifetimes. But it happened. In a series of six matches, Gary Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue. In the first match, Gary won. In the second match, the machine won. Three matches were drawn. And in the last match, the computer was able to defeat the master in chess. Of course, Gary Kasparov didn't think it would be possible. He thought maybe the machine had some human support. IBM said, no way. It was the machine. And we believe it. That's a step in the right direction. Is that intelligence? We'll have to discuss that today. Look at this picture. What is it? All of us don't even need to think to tell us that this is a wheel. How can you teach a computer to know that this is indeed a wheel? By definition, a wheel is going to be a circle. And we don't have a circle here. We have an oval, we have ellipses, however you want to call it. But that's not a circle. So how do you teach a computer to recognize that you have the wheel of a car in this image? Only through training. This is not a circle. The line might not be perfect. The angle is not 90 degrees, as we would like to see in a picture. So therefore, a computer will have trouble if you see an image like that that has not perfect lighting. The angle is not clear, so there is something obstructing the view. An image won't be, a computer won't be able to recognize that. 
However, if you are able to train a machine with millions of these images, a computer eventually will be able to capture the key features of a wheel and eventually give you a result that could achieve 99% of success. That will happen through training over millions and millions of examples and then developing a model that will be able to handle hundreds of parameters to define what's going to be the result. Compare that to a human. And let me bring my little girl, Svetlana Sofia, to the picture here. She went to the zoo, and she learned that this animal, this tall animal with long legs, is called a giraffe. She didn't need to know the name, but she recognizes now a giraffe. So I don't have to teach her any, anything else. Next time we go to the zoo, she will know that this tall animal, yellowish, with black or dark spots, it is the same type of animal she saw before. She learned with one data point. While a computer might need hundreds, thousands, or millions of data points, a human, us as babies, only would need one data point to be able to recognize that this animal belongs to the class giraffe. Of course, she will know the name much later, but nonetheless, she now can recognize this using one data point. How is she able to do so? It is the result of evolution. 800,000 years ago, the Earth faced dramatic climatic changes. Our ancestors, back in the day, were faced with bigger problems. They had to adapt to this type of weather. And given these challenges, their brains grew. Their brains tripled its size over 600,000 years. That brain gave origin to what we call now the Homo sapiens, which is our species. So that growth allowed our brain to connect those neurons. The growth implied that the neurons, the 100 billion neurons that we have in our brains, were able to develop more and more connections, up to 1,000 trillion synaptic connections. And those connections are the ones that make us smarter. It doesn't matter how many neurons we have. We might not use them. But if we use them, we create connections. And those connections are really what we need to become smarter and smarter. Now, guess what? Those connections are alive. Those connections can die too. Imagine the case of neurons. When we're young, when we're babies, our brain is filled with neurons. What are neurons? electrically excitable cells that can process and transmit information through chemical and electric signaling. The brain filled with neurons when we are babies. That is the best time for the babies to actually acquire life skills. And what's the ultimate life skill? To communicate, to be able to speak with a parent, with a relative, with a friend, and that in the first three, four years of life, that is the best time for a child to learn those life skills, one of them being communication. Let me give you an example of my kids. Edgar Felipe and Svetlana Sofia, for instance, at that age, in this particular picture, they were four and three, now they are five and four. They speak Russian with their mother. They speak Spanish with me. They speak English at school with the friends, with the teachers. They are learning some Italian in the school they're going. It's a Montessori school. And they are also learning Chinese on Sunday's schools. So therefore, they are not challenged. For them, it's a game. For them, it's something easy to capture because this is the right time for them to learn those important communication skills. What's going to happen later? When we're going to become teenagers, if we haven't established those synaptic connections, our neurons will die. In fact, our, the number of neurons is going to be reduced by two-thirds when we become teenagers. So it's really that time when we're young that we actually leverage the neurons and are able to create the connections that eventually will help us to become smarter and smarter. 
so much that some people thought that in 2060 we would have experienced what they call super artificial intelligence, a level of intelligence that will be so smart that it would grow by itself. We wouldn't need to do anything to even make it smarter. Probably we're not there yet in target to get to that date. By now, we only have what we call artificial narrow intelligence. What companies, these wonderful applications that we see out there in the market, for now are only applying and leveraging a very narrow form of artificial intelligence. That's not what we can achieve in the future. And that's definitely not what we humans exhibit. For now, computers are only very good in certain aspects, narrow aspects of human activity. The goal, of course, of these developments is eventually is to become, create a type of intelligence that will be very similar to what, how the human brain works. And that indeed has become the inspiration for many researchers to look for ways to become, uh, to make computers that will become smarter. That's what we call today artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, the most effective approach today. We have experienced progress, yes. If you remember, IBM was able to create, to develop a system that was able to defeat these champions of the game called Jeopardy. Jeopardy is a competition on TV when basically the contestant, contestant has to come up with a question to a nuanced way to express an answer. And therefore, it creates an additional complication for a machine to learn. There were very uh, famous champions there who were challenged to face a computer. They didn't think they could be defeated. But again, once and again, the computer with a lot of training, was able eventually to defeat these champions in this game of Jeopardy. We're getting close to what we can call general artificial intelligence. But is it really something that we can call already intelligence? Up for debate. However, even the narrow artificial intelligence that we have today is already helpful. It's already changing our lives. In Brazil, people are faced with a challenge called Zika, the Zika virus, which is a disease that is transmitted by mosquitoes. So if you get a bite from a mosquito, you might receive a virus. And this particular virus is very risky. It can actually impact babies' brains and call diseases like microcephalia. For that, identifying people, moms, that could be contracting this disease, it's important. And that's where AI can help us understand. So therefore, that's one potential application as well as others like education. We have systems already when cameras can help us identify when a student is paying attention or not. There are systems already that can allow us to understand if the student is really following other materials as they should, and how his professors can actually support the student so the student can actually get advantage and not get lost in the pack. AI can help us customize educational programs, and teachers can become more successful. Not only that, if you think about financial services, there are many factors when you think about what's going to be your financial planning. You, of course, we're in our 30s, 40s. We expect to retire when we come 60, 70. Before that, hopefully, we have a place that we can call our own. We have our kids already going to college, already becoming part of the workforce. For that, we have to plan. And for that, there are many factors that are usually an investment advisor, a financial advisor, would have to look to suggest what's our best course of investments. Now, that part of the work can be automated. So AI can now incorporate all this information and come up with a plan for us to consider all these different aspects of our lives. Similarly, insurance. This lady had an accident, unfortunately, today. She went out, she was parking her car, and there was a sign post there that she didn't notice, and she hit it. Guess what? She doesn't need to call the insurance company with anything other than the pictures of what happened then, pictures of the surroundings, and the, with that information, the insurance company will be able to provide a quote or to provide the benefit that she will claim later on. 
So as soon as she takes the pictures and she sends that to the insurance company, she only needs to walk back to her seat in the car and receive claim that is being approved already by the insurance company. Things like that can only be done now today because AI, which is a very important tool in this industry as well. Do you know this person? Who will know him? Most people in the world will have access to an iPhone, an iPad, or to an iPod. We all have these type of devices, the devices that you all need to have. But guess what? He was apparently on top of the world, but that wasn't really the case. He was hiding something. Only a few months before this picture was taken, he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer a very deadly form of cancer that impacts both men and women. Of course, he had access to the best resources any person can aspire. So he indeed went through surgery to try to remove the cancer. He did so. He went through a liver transplant. Unfortunately, only months later, the disease returned and he died. Why do we bring this to our presentation? Because again, AI can give us hope, can give us at least a prospect that this disease can be defeated. How so? Millions of people every year get MRIs, abdominal MRIs, abdominal CAT scans. The images that we are already producing can actually be fed into artificial intelligence models that can actually go through millions of samples, millions of data points, to be able to determine or to predict with a very high accuracy if this person eventually will face this disease. There is hope, and that's the promise of artificial intelligence, not only across healthcare. This AI revolution is about to start. If you think about the level of intelligence of the most advanced machines today, it's probably only at the level of the mammals. Over millions of years, nature did a great job. Now we see if we, working together, AI researchers are able to leapfrog nature. Thank you very much.